to get through. The goal is 24 questions in 30 minutes. Can we do it? Yeah, if you want to, good. Come, come on up. Just go all the way down to the end. We'll keep you up there. So right here. We have a cameo appearance from one of the younger members of the Davis family. He's going to join us here on the end. No questions for him. <laughs> Let's start out with a question up front. All the way in the front row. We got a microphone. All the way in the front row. And we'll go. Hey, Hubert. Andy Wittree, NCAA.com. I'm curious when it comes to Armando playing with fouls. We saw in the March 5th game, he sat briefly after his first and second foul. Last night, he sits briefly, he gets his third, and stays in the court. I think he had four rebounds in the next two minutes. How do you balance your philosophy and feel in the moment as far as him playing through fouls? Well, you know, he got into foul trouble against Duke in the first matchup. He got two quick fouls, and I thought that really hurt us. So moving forward in the first half, every time he gets a, gets a foul, I take him out. And so just trying to manage uh, and make sure that he's available uh, for the most part in the second half. You know, as a tenacious rebounder as he is, you know, he's around bodies all the time. And um, offensively, we, run it, we want to throw the ball to him in the post at all times. And so I understand that there's going to be contact there. And it's just plain and simple, we're a better team with him on the floor. So it's just managing his fouls to make sure that that he stays in the game. We're going to go to the second row. Aaron, we're going to take two questions right there in that second row. Hey, Hubert. Aaron Beard with the AP. Uh, a lot of connections between the programs from Coach Smith and Roy Williams. Your, your connection, I guess, partly being in 91, the final four you played in. Just your memories now of that moment, like kind of how, that, how much that one sticks with you, uh, that game. The 91 game? Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. That, that's. <laughs> That's, With the second uh, question, too, Aaron. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, prior to us winning the uh, national championship in 2017, from 1991 to 2017, I had watched that game at least once every year. Um, it's the best team that I ever played with, with King and Rick and Pete Chilcutt as our seniors and George Lynch, we were as connected as this team is connected now. And we really felt like we had a chance to win a national championship and we came up short. And that was a game that Coach Smith got two technical fouls and got kicked out. And it was an emotional game and an emotional end to a season. And playing at Carolina, the thing that for me that I always wanted was to cut down those nets as a player. And we were so close and weren't able to be able to have that experience. And that was the toughest loss that I've ever experienced in my entire life. And thankful that I had an experience that our opportunity to be an assistant coach and be a part of this again, and to be able as an assistant coach, be a part of the championship in 2017. But that loss was, that was a hard one to take. <laughs> That same part of the room. Hey, Hubert, Brendan Marks from The Athletic. Uh, Leakey had another outstanding defensive game last night against A.J. Griffin. I mean, he's just a racing dudes at this point. How much of a luxury is it for him, for you to be able to have him? And, and obviously, he's going to have a touch matchup tomorrow with Kansas's wings. It's been great. You know, I'm, I'm so glad that nationally, people are seeing how good a defender Leakey is. He's not just a good defender. He, he's elite. He's next level defensively. His length and his athleticism, his versatility. You know, last night he was guarding AJ, he was guarding Paulo, he was guarding Wendell throughout the year. We've tried to split him in half to be able to guard two people as, at once. He's fantastic. And, you know, it's not just his defense, it's his, it's his experience and leadership and his ability to make plays. Like, he has the best assist, to, you know, the turnover ratio on the team. And when we needed somebody to step up and, and make some jump shots, Leakey did that. It's just all year long, when we have needed Leakey to make a play, he has always stepped up and made a play. But defensively, you know, you guys have seen nationally, I, I, there, there can't be more than two or three better wings defensively than, than Leakey. On the right side, we'll go to Pat and then we'll go to CL. Hubert, Pat Forty from Sports Illustrated. I wanted to ask you uh, what you developed from a pers coaching personality, coaching style standpoint, working with the JV team. That's a great question. You know, interesting. 
last night when uh, Caleb was at the free throw line and we were up by two and I told the assistants, if he makes the first one, I'm going to call timeout. And the reason they were like, well, you might ice your player. And I was like, I'm calling timeout. The reason why I called timeout is I was in the same situation as a JV coach. We were playing a prep school team and I decided not to call the timeout. Well, he, he made the first one. I didn't call timeout. He missed the second one. They came down and I had, did not talk to them about when to foul, the process defensively, what we we're doing on a made or missed shot. They came down to hit a three and we lost in overtime. I was thinking that exactly last night in the semifinal game. And I said, I'm not making that mistake again. And so to think that seven years as a head coach for the JV program, obviously it's on a much lesser scale, but you're, you're put in positions to make decisions, whether it's in practice, games, shoot arounds, and that experience that I had on JV, <laughs> that's the first thing that I was thinking about in that situation when Kayla went to the free throw line, and that's why I made that. C.L. Hubert C.L. Brown, Raleigh News and Observer. Um, I was kind of along the same lines of, as you coming into your own as a coach. I was wondering in particular offensively what, what made you attach to wanting to stretch for? Was it kind of seeing games that you guys had lost in the past and thinking that would be helpful? Or was it something else along the way that, that you know, formed your offensive philosophy? Well, I think it was a number of things, CL. Number one, I, I, uh, to me as an assistant, in us scouting teams, that was the most difficult scout to prepare for a team that had a big guy that had the ability to stretch the floor off of ball screens or in transition. And so instead of me stressing going through the scout about how do we defend this guy, how do we play ball screens, how do we match up with them, do we put a small, do we put a big, I was, it would be great if we had one of those guys. We also had the experience of having Luke May and Bryce Johnson. Both of those guys could step out on the floor and make plays, uh, especially Luke May being able as a four to be able to shoot the ball from three. I thought it was really beneficial for us, especially winning the 2017 championship. And then just talking about where basketball is today, I've, I've, you know, for me, from an offensive standpoint, it's fun when you have spacing and balance and a combination of ball and player movement. The only way that you have spacing is you have to have shooters. You can have five non-shooters in the stands, and if they're non-shooters, they're going to still the defenders are still going to be in the lane. And I just felt like having that four that has the ability to play on the outside opens up our offense, makes us more versatile, and I don't think there's anybody better in the country at being able to do that than, than Brady. Front and center, Adam. Hey, Hubert. Adam hey. Zagori, New York Times. Good morning. Um, I'm wondering if you've heard from the great Michael Jordan at all via text or if he's called you. And he was here, I think, in 2017 when they won. And has he had any contact during the year with the team? Does he ever he has, do anything? He, um, I haven't talked to him um, through the NCAA tournament or after last night's game, but they had, when we played NC State at home, they had the 82 reunion for the 82 championship, and he came, and um, it was great being able to spend time with him, and he was able um, to spend a little bit of time with the players. And so I know he's extremely busy, but um, – He's always been in contact throughout the entire season, and I love having Michael's support. I, I'd like him to play. <laughs> that would be great. I don't just want him to show up. I'd like him to play. <laughs> Second row. Hey, Coach. JB Ricks here from Spectrum News One. Um, from my understanding, Caleb Love has had his three highest scoring games during this NCAA tournament run. And we all know about the talent that he brings to the court every night. He went through his slumps and all that throughout the regular season. But what do you think is the main reason for the way he's elevated his game during the most important time of the year? Well, you know, he's one of the things, many things that I love about Caleb is, you know, he wants to be on the biggest stage. And so, you know, I've been a part of a number of 
like in terms of the atmosphere, big time atmospheres as a player and as a coach, last night it was right there. And that's where Caleb wants to be. And there's very few players that want to be on that stage all the time, and Caleb does. The other thing is, you know, he, he has an unbelievable ability to move on to the next play, next possession. So, like, he could – I think he airballed in the second half, and then he would come down and shoot that shot over Mark Williams. You know, he could turn the ball over and next day make a, a really great pass. He's – his ability to move on to the next play is brilliant. And I'm just really happy for him. He's, he's always wanted to be in this position. He's always wanted to make big shots in big time situations. And I'm just really proud of him and I'm happy for him and his family. On the right side in the third row, Pete. Hubert, Pete Thamel from ESPN, you made it very clear last night that Armando is going to play. Um, wondering just if you could give an update on is he going to practice today and, and maybe just speak to the importance of him in the matchup with McCormick, who obviously had a career night the other night. He is going to practice today, but our practice is going to be very limited. I mean, even if he didn't twist his ankle, it, it's going to be limited. Um, um, they did x-rays and they were all negative. Um, obviously, he's a little sore, but he was walking around and feeling good and was very encouraged with um, the amount of swelling from his ankle sprain. And he's ready to play tomorrow night. Um, obviously, it's a great matchup in the post. Two unbelievable post players that um, can rebound the basketball and can score consistently down low in the paint. It's a big emphasis for us as well as Kansas. And um, it could ultimately come down to the winner of that matchup being the, the uh, determining factor of who wins the championship. So, but Armando looks really good and he's very encouraged and ready to play tomorrow night. On the left side of the room, coach, just to the right of the aisle, Barry. Barry Sperluga, Washington Post. Hubert, when you were at ESPN, you would have kind of viewed the sport from a global perspective. What are the issues facing it? You're taking over a, a franchise program now that's a huge job. I wonder, Going forward, do you think you'll be able to speak about the issues facing the sport? Do you feel comfortable doing that? Or can you not think about it because the North Carolina job is such a big job? Um, as of right now, I, don't, I haven't had time to think about it. I've said this before, you know, April 5th will be the exact date that I, that I took the job and I really, even though this year has been fantastic, I've said this, I haven't had time to reflect and think. You know, it's always been next, next game, next practice, next recruit, next media event, just next. It's been busy. And really the only time that I had been able to take in the moment was when I was taking Caleb and RJ and all of them out against St. Peter's. And so, I'm not shy away from, from talking about it and being involved in it. But right now, this whole year, I haven't had time to think. In the, in the times that I do think, it's been 100% on being the best coach that I can be for these players. We're joined now by Caleb Love and R.J. Davis, in addition to head coach Hubert Davis. R.J. and Caleb are going to be with us for 10 minutes, and they're going to head down toward breakout sessions. Coach gets to stay with us for another 10 minutes after that. So Coach Davis will be here for Thank another, you very much. Another 20. Okay. <laughs> uh, we're going to go right to the center of the room. Uh, Andrew Jones, Star Hill Illustrated. It's for Coach and the two players. But you, Coach, you just talked about the McCormick, right here. The McCormick uh, Armando matchup, but what are some of the other things that Kansas does that are just absolutes that you guys are going to have to deal with and, and find a way to work through? Well, um, two things jump out to me. Uh, number one, we're going to have to handle their pressure. Defensively, they're really good. They, they do a terrific job pressuring the ball full court after made and missed baskets. They make it very difficult for you to pass the ball and get into your offense. So we're going to have to handle the pressure. We're going to have to create contact be able to get space so we can catch the ball where we want to to be able to execute our plays properly and be able to run it with pace. I think they're a fantastic defensive team. Uh, they have the versatility to be able to switch a lot of their actions because they have versatile and good defenders. So I think from an offensive standpoint, we've got to handle their pressure. Defensively, I think the biggest thing is transition defense. On, on film, 
they appear to be the fastest transition team that I've seen this year, whether it's on made or missed baskets. They, they sprint to offense, and so it's really important for us um, that our transition defense, you know, we're always having an in-game, and our in-game and transition defense is no layups or dunks, no pitch ahead, lace up threes, make them make two passes or more so the defense can get set. We're going to have to do that tomorrow night, and I feel very comfortable against our set defense that uh, the way that we've been playing defensively, that, that, that we can do a good job on the defensive end. But those are two areas that are going to be key for us. RJ, first, and then Caleb, your thoughts on Kansas and the matchup? Uh, what Coach Davis said. Good answer. And Caleb, anything uh, to add? Yeah, what Coach Davis said. <laughs> We're going to have a, we have a question now from uh, Lawrence Journal World, so this may be a Kansas-related question from Zach up front. Yeah, Zach Boyer from Lawrence Journal World. I guess to build a little bit off of what Barry was asking about, uh, Hubert, um, you know, Bill Self was talking a little bit earlier about Roy Williams is retired and Mike Krzyzewski is now done. And kind of what he said, there's, there's this need for coaches to carry the mantle now as kind of that, that iconoclast, that, that big time name coach. Um, how would you put him in that classification? How would you find the need to do that now as his program now in this, in this game and everything goes into this next decade and, and moving forward? Well, in regards to Coach Self, you know, he's a part of that group. <laughs> he just is. You know, the job that he has done throughout his entire career, not just on the court, but in the classroom, in the community, um, the way that he loves his players, how hard his players play for him, the impact that he's made for his players, um, not only in basketball, but in life. That's, that's the determining factor to me on a really good coach, that it's not just about basketball, it's about people, it's about relationships, it's about lives. And Coach Self is a part of that group of Coach K and Coach Williams that has consistently done that um, for a long period of time. We're gonna go kind of third row on the right, Chuck. Yeah, um, Coach Davis, Chuck Culpepper from the Washington Post. Um, this annual viewing of the uh, 91 game, even I guess as an NBA veteran, this self-torture that you mentioned, um, <laughs> what would it be like? The, would it make, would you get to the end? Would it make you cry or cringe or have a stomach ache? It would, would make me cry. Would you be alone? Would you have a nice pet nearby or something like that? No, I, I would, it would make me cry. And I was hoping that it's interesting, every time that I watched it, I would think it's, it's gonna turn out differently. <laughs> and um, I just did, you know, one of the things that I told the guys um, before we, I think it was before we came to New Orleans, I know it was during the NCAA tournament, I said the best experience is tears, but I've told them this, the best experience that I have had as a player hands down, was going to the Final Four. So that was a place of, you know, tears of joy, but that was the best place personally that I'd ever experienced. And I told him, I said, you know, I played 12 years in the NBA, and that was my finest, as, as a basketball player, finest moment, just being a part of the Final Four. And I was trying to convey to them of how special it is to be here. And now that they're being able to experience it is great. So it was tears of joy, but it was also a place that I enjoyed so much that I wanted to be a part of again. Third row on the left. Uh, Pat Welter, WRL Sports. Hubert, I've asked uh, all the players this throughout the week, just about, I know we gotta get some questions to the guys, but I already asked these guys this, this week, your sayings that you have, energy, effort, and toughness, the, the phone, the family, the friends, the noise. Um, how do you kind of come up with these, and why is it important to kind of have these things that are, are so well-formed and thought out that you believe in them so much and you repeat them so much? I don't know where I got that from. I just, but I, I feel like it was important. I, I do think it's important to continue to repeat it because I believe in it. You know, I just, I'm so impressed with them at like their age. I just didn't ha have <clears throat> that type of noise in my life, you know, and um, I think it's so important to be able to focus on what is real and what is right. And um, 
I didn't sit at home and just think of these phrases and go, okay, I'm these catchphrases and this is what I'm going to give Caleb and RJ today and I'm just going to say it over and over again so I believe it and they believe it. It's just something that I believe and I felt like it was what the team needed. And I feel like they have understood where I was coming from and they have adopted it or accepted it. And I think that's a reason why that they're able to play so well under the big lights is because of their ability to block out the noise and to believe the things that we've been talking about as a team throughout the season. We have RJ and Caleb just for a few more minutes. We're going to go to the back of the room to the right with Jeff. Coach is going to stay for about another 12. RJ and Caleb only for another two before they go to the breakout. So let's try to get some student athlete questions before they go. Jeff. All right, I got you. Um, Thank you, Jeff. Jeff Goodman for both Caleb and RJ. When I saw you guys play in November, you you weren't as much fun to watch. Now you guys are fun to watch. You play together. You play hard. You play tough. What flipped it? What was it that, that allowed you to turn that around? RJ first, then Caleb. Hmm. Um, I'd say we were fun to watch. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say we weren't fun to watch at all. Uh, you know, me and Caleb have been playing together for the past two seasons, and uh, we've definitely built a lot of chemistry on and off the court. Um, and we've definitely progressed in our game. The way we were able to find each other, you know, uh, when we're hot, we know what sp uh, spots we like the ball, um, and the way we're able to lead our team. Um, and I think that's been all year. It's been consistent all year. I mean, nothing and no one said it was going to be easy. And, and basketball is the game of runs. You're going to go through ups and downs. And not going to be perfect. So, um, but I would say we were fun to watch all year. Caleb. Yeah, same thing. Uh, you know, uh, I feel like we were fun to watch all year long. Uh, we were still trying to find each other. It was a whole new group. Um, it was early in the season. I mean, it was in November. So, uh, to say we're not fun, we weren't fun to watch is uh, outrageous to me. But uh, uh, I mean, like. Like RJ said, you know, we've been jailing all year and uh, we got one more game left to solidify ourselves that we are fun to watch. Last night was pretty fun. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Final question for the student athletes on the left and then we'll let these guys make their way to breakouts. RJ, Caleb, did you get a chance, Josh Graham, WSJS by the way, did you guys get a chance to see the reaction on Franklin Street and, and what coach said he wanted you guys to enjoy the night and enjoy the win? Did you guys get a chance to explore New Orleans at all? RJ first, please, then Caleb. Not that much. I, I wanted them to enjoy. Not that much. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, guys. Um, nah, I saw uh, a couple of pics um, on Instagram and Snapchat. It looked really crazy. And I had a, a friend out there who actually FaceTimed me just to flip the screen and show me like what it was like on Franklin Street. And it was actually just, it was great to see how much our fans, you know, and friends, you know, care and love for this place and university. So. Yeah, you know, uh, I seen a lot of videos and pictures, and uh, you know, it was great to see. Uh, you know, we we do it. It's crazy to see that our, our play is like creating memories for them too. Uh, so that's just a blessing in disguise. But uh, yeah, it was it was great to see. We want to thank RJ and Caleb for joining us here in the main interview room. They're going to head down the hallway to the breakout areas where they're going to be joined by teammates like Armando Baycott, Brady Manick. They're going to take their placards as well <laughs> very efficient a lot of experience there we're going to go to zoom for a question from chris for coach davis chris we got you right now chris can you hear us all right we're going to go to dan wilkin in the back of the room that's dan Dan Walken, USA Today. Hubert, I'm curious, how much does having a son who's basically the same age as your players inform how you deal with them and everything that goes into being a head coach? <laughs> this is my oldest son, Elijah. He's a freshman at University of Lynchburg, and so he's missing class tomorrow to be at my game tomorrow night, so I appreciate it. He's, he's liking that, and so uh, he plays basketball there. Um, just being a father. Um, it helps. Um, I look at and I tell the parents, I'm not, their, I'm not your son's parent, 
but every decision that I make will be filtered through what is in the best interest for your son and what I think you would do for your son. And so I'm not their basketball coach. I'm just a person in their life that is trying to help them, that's trying to serve them, that's trying to uh, support them and care for them. And so, you know, the same way that I care for my three children is the same way that I care for the players. I just want things to work out for them. And so I wouldn't say because of my oldest son, it's easier for me to relate to them. But I would say being a father helps me relate to the players because that's the way that I coach. Coach, we're going to take a question from the Daily Tar Heel right there. Know how I know it's the Daily Tar Heel? That's right. <laughs> Hey, Coach, uh, PJ Morales, The Daily Tar Heel. You talk a lot about the connectedness that you wanted to foster on this team, the same connectedness that you felt with your 91 team. How important, especially now in this moment, in the last game, <clears throat> pardon me, in the last game of the season, how important is that now more than ever? No, it really is. Not just in our last game. It, it was the most important thing throughout the entire season. I've, you know, this program is built on relationships. That's the foundation of what has made Carolina basketball, Carolina basketball. One of the things throughout the summer that I made the guys do is they, they have a requirement to stop by my office at least three times a week. And so, and when you stop by my office, you cannot talk about basketball. And so, you know, we talk about video games and TV shows and, you know, they talk about Snapchats and, you know, Instagrams and all kinds of stuff like that. And then during the season where it's a little bit more difficult with classes and everything, I said, you have to stop by the office at least once. And so just being able to have those experiences away from the court, I always tell them that if the only communication that I have with you is out there on the floor, I'm not doing my job. And so just being able to talk with them outside of the court makes it so much better to communicate when we're on the court. And I always say that you can't play for me unless you know me, and I can't coach you unless I know you. And so the only way that I can get to know you and you can get to know me is we got to spend time together. And that's what we have done this year, and that's what makes times like this, playing for a national championship, so, so, um, so impressive, so much fun. On the right side toward the back, Zach. Raise your hand so we can see you, Zach. Zach Brazil in your post. Uh, Hubert, when, when you first saw RJ, I think it was the summer going into his senior year, he, a lot of the big schools really had kind of weren't sure if he was good enough. What, what did you see in him that made you think this guy is going to be a really good player? You know, it was interesting. I was, um, it was during the live period um, in recruiting, and I actually was in Kansas City um, looking at uh, Under Armour circuit, and I flew in, took a red eye to get to the Nike circuit um, for one day. And the EYBL had a series of games from 8 in the morning to 12, and then that was it. And so I said, you know, in order to, to, to be able to see everybody, I was just – I couldn't sit at just one game and watch one game. I needed to just walk around. And so that's all I did was just walk around. And then I turned around and saw RJ. He was playing for uh, the – New York uh, Renaissance, hit a three. And then I was looking at another game and just turned around. I saw him get a steal and a lay-in. And then I'm watching another game and I turned around and he hit another three. And, and then I kept looking and walking around to other games and then I turned around and he hit another three. And I came back to Coach Williams. I said, you know, he's not the tallest guard, but I said, he's tough, he's gritty, he's, you know, he's from New York. And I've always enjoyed, you know, guys that played from the New York, New Jersey area, because I feel like they have a sense of toughness that you have to have out there on the floor. And eventually later in the summer, Coach Williams offered him. And so that's how I saw him. I just, he just kept making winning plays um, every time that I watched him on the floor. And I just felt like that would be the perfect fit for us because he was making plays on the ball and off the ball. And I just felt like that's one of the things that we needed. We needed a guard that can make plays in many different areas. And that's what RJ did in that game that I saw him that morning. And that's what he's done uh, throughout his brief career here at North Carolina. And a great reference to the Wrens. Yes. <laughs> Back right, CL. Hubert, CL again. Um, you've talked about coaching as, as missionary work and, and as it relates to your players. But how do you want to be, how do you want 
to define yourself as a coach in terms of the X's and O's, in terms of the, the, the basketball side of everything? I don't want to be defined at all. I don't really care about what definition I have as a coach or that just, that's something that I just don't think about. That's something that I'm not concerned about. That's not something that I think about at all. You know, my job is to be the head coach of the University of North Carolina, and my job is to do that to the best of my ability. And I've said it since I took over in the press conference. I'm, you know, the foundation of Carolina basketball will always be here because it's been tried and tested and proven successful, and I've experienced it. But I'm going to do this with my own personality in my own shoes, and I feel very comfortable me being me. And so however anyone defines me, then that's – their definition, but that's not of any concern to me. My concern is this university, my concern is this program, and my concern is, are these players. Our satellite time ends in about 90 seconds. Let's take another question back left. Hey, Coach, this is Rafael from the Three Point Conversion over here. Coach, I know you've learned a lot about your players throughout this process, but what have you learned about yourself as a coach from day one to now? I don't know. You know, as I said before, I just really haven't had time to have to go down that road and to really think and to really process what has happened this year. I've, I've had to take on things literally on the run. And I'm really looking forward to hopefully after a great day tomorrow night <laughs> that I'll have a little bit of time to be able to catch my breath and be able to just take in what this whole year has been about. It's not just this run in the NCAA tournament, it's just the entire season, the trust of the players and the parents to allow a first year head coach um, to coach their son, um, to be able to do this alongside an assistant coaching um, group that I think is the best in the country with friends that I grew up with and that are a part of Carolina basketball the support of the fans, the students. There's so many things, the impact that it's had on my kids. Now, this is the first time that their dad has been in the limelight. They weren't alive when I was playing in the NBA. This is the first time that I've been in the limelight and my wife has been in it as well. And so the impact on my wife and my kids, there's a number of things that I'm looking forward to, to processing, um, but it's not the time to do that right now. The time right now is to stay focused and, and, um, and continue to look at what we need to do to play our best tomorrow night. That's the only thing that I'm thinking about. We want to thank Coach Davis and Son for joining us here okay, this thank afternoon. You. <laughs> and best of luck tomorrow night, gentlemen. All right, thank you. Thanks, thank you so much.